Welcome to another edition of Fundamentals. We are delighted to welcome Steve Levy of ESPN to the program today. Now, Steve just called one of the greatest games in Monday Night Football history and arguably the best game of the 2020 NFL season so far. We all watched Monday night as the Ravens and the Browns traded punches like heavyweight fighters. And Steve and the Monday Night Football crew, in my opinion, rose to the occasion, conveying the excitement and the drama and just the sheer adrenaline rush of the NFL at its best. Now, this season, Steve became only the seventh play-by-play -play commentator in the 50-plus year history of Monday Night Football. And before Monday Night Football, you knew him as a sports center anchor and also calling both NHL and college football games. So let's light this candle with Steve Levy. So, Steve, what was it like to call that game? Uh, it was back and forth, setting records left and right. Tell us uh, your take. Well, first of all, Mike, thanks for having me on. We, we did we did not see that coming. Um, you know, I, I we were joking around with people. Hey, maybe that's you know it's a nine six slugfest. We didn't think there'd be a lot of possessions, right? These are the two two of the three best running teams in the NFL. So we thought points would be at a premium. And I, I know it's rude to look at my phone, but I want I want to spit back these numbers and get them accurate for you. Uh, my spotter is a guy by the name of Ben Boma, well known in the circles, and he sent me this last night. And it just puts it in perspective. Here you go. Check this out. So in the game on Monday night, we had 35 points in the fourth quarter, okay? Just before – so high score in fourth quarter, right? You get that. 27 points in the last six and a half minutes, okay? We had 20 points in the last minute 51. I mean, think about that for a second. Inside the two-minute warning, 20 points. And then the all-important – Five points in the last two seconds of the game. So uh, it was crazy. It felt big. Look, and, you know, those games can go two ways, right? There's fun. You're up and down. They're high scoring. But then the the meaning in the standings as well, like how critical it was for Baltimore to stay alive. You know, Lamar Jackson taking care of whatever business he was taking care of. And I don't choose to get interested and involved in that. And, uh, and Baker Mayfield, could he answer? And he could. I mean, it was – it was classic. You know, I'd like to think I'll see a few more of these games, these kind of games, but you really never know. And uh, I do think it was the game of the NFL season. It was really cool to be part of it. Yeah. Steve, to me, you had a couple of great calls during the game I want to ask you about. You know, one is Lamar Jackson. As you mentioned, whatever the hell happened in the locker room, you described him as Superman coming out back on the field to save the day. And bang, first uh, play, he throws a 40-yard touchdown. But then yeah. he also said, Baker Mayfield, how do you answer? Tell me your favorite calls from the game. So I certainly enjoyed that. I thought the coolest shot we had was, now listen, I've got a lot of voices in my head when I'm not working, but I've got even more when I am working because of the setup really with, you know, health and safety. We can't have anybody near us except the, the, the three of us in the booth. We're all distant. So instead of people helping me in the booth, I have extra monitors and extra extra people being able to talk to me. And so we are rolling to break. It's the two-minute warning. We have to go to break. And, in you know, uh, Phil Dean, my producer, is counting me down. All right, Steve, breaking five, four. And then I think Jimmy Platt, our director, says, I've got Lamar running back on the field. So now I've got to process that, right? I have now three seconds, and I think I said, you know, here comes Lamar Jackson as the break rolls, right? So so there's so much going on, and, and the, that's the fun. Like, some of the stuff is scripted, right? We're not fooling everybody. The open, everybody kind of knows what's going to happen halftime. But it's really it, – it's, it's the realest of reality TV, and especially when you have stars and big names and big moments, so – so this is all happening. Now we're in the two-minute warning. We can't wait. And, oh, by the way, so now, and we checked, he had been off the field real time, not game time, about 45 minutes. That's a long time. So Greasy's thinking that, that could be two IV bags. I mean, the amount of time it takes, get back there, get the needle in your arm, get the bags inside of you, and, you know, feel better and all of that. So he runs out on the field, we're out of the two-minute warning, and, oh, by the way, it's fourth and five, Right? There's no, there's no time to take a playoff, let me run a draw a play, a screen, get comfortable. I mean, he is right in it. And I almost got caught, Mike, 
because there's so much open space in front of him. I thought he was going to run it. So did the defensive backs. They all come up to protect the run. He puts the air underneath it, and Marquise Brown were all over Marquise Brown the whole game. He dropped at least three passes, hangs on to this one, touchdown. It was just, you know, again, you couldn't script something like that. It was such a cool moment, so much fun to be a part of. And, you know, I hope everybody at home enjoyed it. Yeah. And then right around that time, you had another uh, great little call. I don't think a lot of uh, the audience get it, but sports historians did. You made a Willis Reed reference. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed Greeny used the same thing on Get Up on Monday. Talk about that. So, listen, you know, a a man of my advanced years and where I grew up in, you know, the New York City, Long Island area, that's ingrained in in our brains. And it's Marv Albert making the call. And here comes Reed, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, uh, Game seven, NBA championship, and Reed had been down and out. And, you know, as people told me afterwards, and I I was reminded, he he didn't have a really good game. I think he hit his first shot, and I'm not sure Willis Reed hit another basket. But the point is, he came and rallied the team. But so I'm definitely thinking in my head I'm going to go this way. But there's a big part of me thinking, you know what, I'm going to lose maybe half the audience. It's not necessarily only an age issue. Uh, but an East Coast thing too, right? Because it's so New York, it's so Knicks. Uh, But then I said, hey, you know what? The the people who get it will get it, will appreciate it. And for the younger generation, I would just go Superman with the cape. So I I tried to cover all the bases there, but uh, it was a really cool moment. And I did, look, my contemporaries, and I won't put you in that category, you're probably much younger than I am, Mike, but my people all love the Willis Reed reference. Yeah, I I loved it too. And now let's get to the ultimate bad beat. Uh, you know what I mean? It was almost like a setup for Van Pelt. Yeah. Crazy safety. It, how do you think uh, viewers reacted? Were their TVs broken all over uh, the country? So, listen, we had the, it's two weeks in a row now because we had Philadelphia and the Eagles are not going to win the game. And the, the, they score a late touchdown on a Hail Mary and then go for two. Like, like, there's so many things at play there. First of all, it's the Eagles with Wentz. They can't get anything done. They complete a Hail Mary and go for no reason go for two and get the two. So that turned into a big gambling thing as well. And um, and so did this obviously on Monday night became a thing. Listen, I'm not really focused on it. I'm aware of it, right? I know what the spread is. I know what the over under. I under, I'm, you know, not, I'm not putting my head in the sand. But I also know the NFL definitely does not want their broadcasts getting into it. I think, you know, you're Al Michaels, you're Al Michaels. You have certain leeway. You know, you're the, you're the legend. Of the chair, right? <laughs> Al can pretty – untouchable. He can pretty much do whatever he wants. Uh, you know, me, I'm, what, 14 games into this. and So I'm not going to I'm not gonna go there. I think you can hear it in my voice a little bit uh, when the safety happens. And I think it's one of those, you know, if you know, you know. But, no, uh, I'm not going to hit you over the head with it. That's for sure. And I know – as soon as you know, I say here's Scott Van Pelt, and I know Van Pelt is just shrugging his shoulders there, and that was great TV for them. So I think yeah. you, know, you got the best of both worlds, I think, in those last 30 seconds. Yeah, they, they had the little box with Van Pelt just making the face. Right. Uh, it was perfect. Somebody, somebody should get an award for that one. Right. Now, as you just said, Steve, you're only 14 games into this. You know, Monday Night Football has a new announced team. Yourself, Lewis Riddick. Greasy, John Perry, and of course the great Lisa Salters. You got a new producer, Phil Dean. You got a new director, Jimmy Platt, who only uh, came on last season. Right. You got a reputation inside ESPL as kind of a no drama team player. Tell us how this new team is gelling this season. Uh, honestly, I feel really good about things. I'd give it to you straight. And I, I didn't always necessarily feel that way. Like, you know, we started okay, but it, it does take some time. I never want to be the excuse guy. Look, you know, the NFL teams all talked about preseason games. Nobody needed preseason games more than we did, you know. Like, we could have really benefited from a rehearsal or a preseason game. And, Mike, I'll I'll tell you this, and I don't think people get this either. uh, As we get ready for our our 15th game, uh, we have the six of us that you just mentioned, we have never been in the same room once. Not, Not a single time have we been in the same room once. Not a drink. Not a breakfast, not a production meeting. So so it's taken some time to sort of get together. So Greasy and I had the advantage of doing college football for the last four years together. But I'd never worked with Phil Dean before. I'd never met Jimmy Platt before. 
Uh, Lewis Riddick and I did some studio stuff, you know, Super Bowl week or Sports Center. Uh, we did one game last year, the Monday Night Football, the, the second game of doubleheader week one. But so, you know, there's so much more in terms of gelling as a group than the three hours on the air. There's the traveling together, right? There's uh, training camps and the meals. Like I mentioned, like we're not even allowed to go to the stadium in the same car from the hotel. So, you know, we're dealing with some some different things this year, just like everybody else is, just like the NFL is and just like everybody at home. Uh, we're dealing, we're trying to be flexible, we're trying to be understanding. But I, I will say this, we have absolutely improved every single week. Uh, and me personally, I'm, I'm constantly tweaking to try to get to a good place uh, where I feel really comfortable and uh, I'm starting to, to get more comfortable. And I think we all really felt good about Monday night. Look, the game is, is a big part of that, right? Like, uh, sign of a true professional is making uh, a lousy broadcast, a, a lousy game, a good broadcast. But when you get a classic game like on Monday night, we're, we're trying to stay out of the way, man. We're we're trying to enhance it a little bit, but really stay out of the way. That kind of game takes care of itself. Now, Steve, we got some breaking news we got to ask you about. Uh, Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport are reporting that. Your uh, on air partner, Lewis Riddick, is interviewing for not one but two NFL GM jobs. Uh, what is your reaction to that? Uh, I know Lewis is very highly thought of uh, within league circles as a front off executive, but would it be tough to lose him from the team? Well, definitely. Like I said, we're just getting started, we're just getting rolling. But, you know, I want, I want whatever Lewis wants for himself. Uh, the only thing that surprises me about that that report you had is that it's not, you know, three or four teams that are interviewing. He's looked – his uh, his football knowledge, his football IQ is off the charts. Really, him and Greasy, too, they are the two most cerebral NFL minds that I know. And I can tell you that these production meetings, you know, we're talking to coaches and players every week. You know, and quite frankly, a lot of it goes right over my head. I mean, it's – you know, there's some serious stuff being discussed and – and formations and terminology, and I can see how Lewis loves it. Lewis loves talking ball. That's that's what he's about. That's like what he's meant to do. Nobody enjoys those production meetings more than Lewis Riddick. And he would go on and on if we let him. If we didn't say, hey, we you know we got to wrap this up at some point, or the players and teams didn't say, hey, you know, coach has a time limit. Lewis would go on and on. He loves talking about it. He watches so much film. He's obviously super bright. And uh, listen, you know, I, I hope he, I hope he gets whatever he wants. It, you know, I know he loves the Monday Night Football gig, too. I get the sense for the right general manager game, uh, gig, he, he'd be gone because I think that's, uh, you know, that's something really super special. But uh, we'll see how it plays out. I wish him the best. He's been a great partner. And again, he's so bright. He's going to he's going to improve any NFL team uh, quickly, I think, uh, that, that signs him on. Steve, is TV the quickest way back to the NFL? I mean, you know, you got possibly Lewis, you got Gruden, you got Mayock. Uh, it seems like everybody who's uh, calling games big time, you know, ends up back in the league at an even bigger job. So that is not lost on me. And, and only, you know, in the last couple of years have I thought of that. Like, we, we get a lot of inside information. We get a lot of, you know, classified NFL intel from these players and coaches every week that no one else has access to. And so whoever is doing these high-level broadcasts or, you know, you're seeing two teams every single week, usually the better teams, and seeing those teams on more than one occasion. If, if nothing else, while you're absolutely getting information on how these teams operate, you might be learning for, you know, uh, either you might be learning about a future division foe, right, a division rival if you take a certain job, um, but you might be learning how you're going to run your own program. Hey, I see what they're doing over there. We're not going to make that mistake whenever I get my GM job, whichever team that might be. So uh, it's a smart play. It's a smart play, and there's you know there's certain financial leverage there too, I would imagine, uh, which is also a smart play by these uh, future GMs or coaches. So makes all the sense in the world. Uh, I don't believe any of those offers are coming my way, though, so uh, I'll just try to keep getting the score right once in a while. Yeah, my namesake, Mike McCarthy, should have gotten a TV job instead of studying film in his garage for a year. He, he, yeah, he had, he's in a tough spot, man. But I hear, I hear he's good for next year. Hey, there's no way the Cowboys can have another season uh, like this one next season. So they'll figure it out. He's a good guy. 
What's interesting to me, Stephen, I don't know if you've noticed, is even though this is a brand new Monday Night Football team, and even though, as you said, you've had to socially distance and just haven't had the reps, you're getting far less criticism on social media than the previous team of uh, Tessator and Booger. Not to mention, of course, the two seasons ago with Jason Witten and Booger and, uh, and Joe. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I'm really trying to stay in my own lane, you know, like uh, I love those guys. And when I first got the gig, uh, I reached out to Joe Tessitore. Joe Tess has been gracious with his time to me going back to college football. Bef long before Joe got the Monday night gig, you know, he was doing the high level college game and I was coming back into the college game from Sports Center, And Joe was great on the phone. I reached out to Sean McDonough. He's been a terrific friend. I spent you know, an hour, hour and a half with Mike Tirico on the phone. So, and, and in essence, the message was from all three of those great guys who are colleagues and sort of brothers in the business, but also I consider close friends of mine. They were also like, you're going to find your own way, right? So I think I, I've started to do that. People always, you know, what's your style? I really don't think I have a style. I'm sort of straightforward, nuts and bolts. I think one of my strengths, Mike, is uh, – I defer. And, you know, you don't see that from every play-by-play -play person. Like, I know what I don't know. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to show everyone I know all, everything. So I defer to Greasy and Riddick. They've been there. They've played the game. To John Parry on the rules, too, you know. So um, I'm trying the straightforward approach. I'm trying to do my own thing and, and really focus on the nuts and bolts, especially early on now. Um, you know, being my first season in the NFL. So, but I think, you know, I'd like to think uh, that people are enjoying us um, and and we're working, we're trying really hard. We work really hard at this. And uh, if people like us, that's that's really great. And I'm, and listen, I, I do see Twitter. I'm not, I'm not going to say, you know, I don't read, I don't listen to the talk radio and I don't read the newspapers. I'm not that athlete or coach. And I see Twitter, I check it out. I kind of want to know what people are saying and, and I'm not insulted uh, when they're when they're you know when they hate me. And uh, but by the same token, when they say, "Hey, you're great," I sort of take that with a grain of salt too. I feel like those two things cancel each other out. Yeah. Knock on wood. ESPN's Monday Night Football has been a real bright spot for the NFL this season. Uh, Derek Volner tells me that audiences are up four straight weeks year over year. Why? Yeah, look, I'd love to take credit for that. And, of course, you know, I can't. I think, um, I, I, listen, people who know uh, realize the announcer really is not is not impacted. I, I think the studies show maybe it's a 1% kind of thing. You want to watch the game, you're going to watch the game. If you don't want to watch the game, it's, it's not going to be about the announcers because you didn't want to watch the game. We're trying to enhance it, right? If, I, if we can make it slightly more enjoyable for you than with having the mute button on, then that's the win, right? Uh, inform and entertain, and that's sort of been our thing. Let's try to enhance it, make it a little better for the person who's watching at home or wherever they're watching. So, um, you know, I know down for – so we're up week over week. I think we're down on the season, but everybody's down on the season. And I think I think we're down less than most of the networks are, but everybody's down. It's a, it's a crazy year, Mike, 2020. I hope we get back to, you know – uh, some normalcy next season, and those numbers will go up. And I, I miss the fans in the stadium. And I think that really adds to a broadcast, too, you know. So uh, the players and the broadcast, too, had to find their own energy in those empty stadiums. It was really cool in Cleveland. Like, they had the 12,000 people there, and you could hear them. Uh, so that was neat. So, listen, again, like I said, I'm, I'm really trying to get the score right, get the players' names and uniform numbers right, and the yardage. And I can't be worried about ratings and all that stuff. I got enough on my plate, you know. You're right. I mean, with these empty stadiums or near empty stadiums, it seems like sports is missing its natural soundtrack. And the fans give the, the players, and I would assume the broadcasters too, a lot of energy. You guys play off that. As you mentioned, the NFL is down across the board 8%, uh, although that number is going to – we haven't gotten the week 14 numbers. Is it a combination of factors? Is it one factor you're looking at? What is your theory? You know, I don't know. People th thought that the, you know, the empty stadiums would mean there'd be more people watching at home, right? There's no, not tailgating, but the, the, the numbers are so small because it's such a giant piece of the pie in terms of the population watching. I, I don't know why. I, I always thought the numbers would be higher 
because people missed sports. I think when sports first came back, you know, look at the 30 for 30. We were starving for any sports, right? right. And and the Michael Jordan piece comes out. And, you know, that blew everyone away, right? ESPN did a great job. We, we rushed the end of that production to get that out. And um, my takeaway from all of this, Mike, really has been like, I didn't think, you know, I don't know if it's half the population that are sports fans. I, I think maybe it's more, but I, I, I think people appreciate how much sports means to America now when we had to go so long without it. Even if you weren't a diehard sports fan, I think it played a piece. I think it played a, a role in your life in some way. It touched you in some way. And I think that'll be one of the great takeaways, that sports is actually – you know, it's it's our livelihood, but sports is actually more important than I think a lot of people thought it was. And so uh, that's really cool to be a part of. I, I I mean, it's it's a little gimmicky, but when I come on on Monday night and I wouldn't do this next season, but I, I, I open the show when we come on camera and, you know, maybe you notice, maybe you have. I always say a happy Monday night, everybody, you know, like like things have been so down and, and so sour and everybody's so upset. And when we get to Monday night and there's an NFL game and a good NFL game, to me, it is. It's a happy Monday night, you know, and I'm trying to convey that even from an empty stadium. And the NFL's done a remarkable job. I mean, here we are. Every game has been played. They are on target for 256 regular season games in 17 regular season weeks. And that is remarkable. I don't think anyone would have thought that would happen. I know games have got moved around, but as of this second – they have played every game on the schedule to this point. And um, I'm looking forward to the next two happy Monday nights in a wild card game, too. Yeah. And as you and your crew said on Monday night, and I heard Dan Graziano on Get Up make a similar point uh, either this morning or the other morning, is that a game like that is a reminder of why the NFL is playing and why we love football, because we all need something like that, a thriller in Manila, to take our minds off what's otherwise been a terrible year. And the NFL is truly a national game. I think there are other sports where is if your team, your favorite team is not playing, you know, maybe you don't have the same kind of interest level. But the NFL and the NBA to a, a big extent is is like that too because it's such a it's such a superstar driven league. The NBA and the NFL. Like, you know, Baltimore and Cleveland for example are not giant television markets, right? And they're located in the same sort of corridor on the map. So geographically, so and yet it does this great national number. So why is that, right? Late in the season, important. I think people, you know, the Cleveland Browns kind of have a national reputation, by the way, as a national, and not always for, for winning, probably more for losing, right? But Baker Mayfield is, is on every other commercial, right? Lamar Jackson, I mean, these are big-time stars. And as you saw, the numbers build towards the end of the game. It's definitely people calling their buddies and texting and tweeting. Hey, you watching this game? Those numbers I gave you when we started, right? All the points in the fourth quarter. So I know the ratings gradually went up, and our highest number was at the very end. And listen, we, we were, you know, Tucker doesn't hit a 55-yard field goal. We're going to overtime. So, yes, America, America needs the NFL. It really is our pastime. And it almost doesn't matter who's playing, what uniform, what colors they're wearing, what dirty laundry they're wearing, right? It's about, it's about the stars, the big name, the excitement, the great plays. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just so enjoyable. I, look, I obviously love sports. I have as a kid. I'm so lucky to be able to make a, a living, you know, doing what I love to do. Yeah. One of Seinfeld's greatest lines, right? We, we, we don't ride for players. We root for laundry. Right. It's true. Absolutely. Like the guy you hate the most, your arch enemy, your biggest villain, he gets traded to your team. I love him. He's my favorite player. Let me buy his jersey, right? <laughs> Steve, before the season started, uh, some critics, including myself, doubted the idea of doing a three-person booth again. Uh, what has it been like to sort of be the point guard for a three-person booth? Is it more difficult, more challenging than just you and one analyst? Uh, listen, I, I would say it's different, and uh, I would I would say that's fair. Regardless of who I was with, uh, it's more challenging working with two analysts than one, whoever they might be, and that's just uh, a sharing of the of the pie. You know, I will say this: we had the benefit, and look, Brian Greasy is a, a no ego kind of guy, and that's the only way this works. 
And so when Greasy and I did college football, we had Todd McShay. And so he was on the field, but he was like a field analyst, not your traditional sideline reporter. So McShay's microphone was always open. And so in essence, that was sort of like a three-man booth, except Todd was down on the field. But that speaks to, you know, Brian Greasy, who obviously had a great college career, a good NFL career, a lot, you know, a starting quarterback in big places. And so for him to have no ego at this point and to be able to share. And uh, and Lewis is like that as well, but Lewis was much more of a, a newcomer to not not television, but the, the play-by-play of the game, the actual live in the booth. What I loved about the mix was, you know, Brian has the offense down, right? Head coaching kind of offense, clock management, play calling. Lewis not only brings you NFL experience on the defensive side, but also being in the front office, right? Salary cap, managing people, all those things. So I really thought it was a great mix. And if ever, Mike, you're going to have a three-man booth, like this would be the season because there is no crowd noise. I'm the first guy to, we call it laying out, right? After a big play, lay out. Third down, lay out, let the crowd roar, defense get fired up and and so we don't have that. So if you were ever going to have a three-man booth, this was really the season for it because we have some time there. And the only other advantage I would say to this goes back to not having the crowd is you're hearing the acoustics from the field, right? Right. They're really, really cool. You're hearing much more of the play calls. I think everybody got a kick out of it on social media. So Mayfield goes to the line this past Monday night, and he's like, Stifler, Stifler. <laughs> and, you know, that triggers everybody's mind, American, American Pie, right? The great movie. <laughs> Stifler's mom, right? So that whole thing. So uh, we're hearing a lot of that. I'm trying to think. I was Derek Carr mentioned uh, John Gruden's wife in an audible. Like, you know, so there's been some of that sound from the field. Uh, so that's another piece of the three-man booth. But um, it really takes – it takes no ego from from the analysts, I would say. Because, you know what, they're the ones sharing the, their space, right, Mike? I'm still speaking almost the same amount. I'm still doing the play-by-play call. I kind of stop how they decide who's going to speak next or, you know, I don't have to do any hand signals or it's coming from Phil Dean in the truck, but that's sort of not my business. And then whenever they finish, then I'll start speaking again. So I, I try to stay out of the way there. Yeah. Steve, uh, Monday Night Football is literally the granddaddy of primetime NFL games. Uh, it's a classic franchise. How does it feel to be only the seventh play-by-play commentator in the history of this franchise? Cosell, Gifford, Michaels, you name them. Listen, that, that's not lost on me. I mean, I, I respect the history. And uh, it's look, it's so far-fetched to think as a kid you could get this job. And what I mean by that is there's only one seat, right? There's only one seat. Whatever minuscule percentage there is, you know, in, in playing professional sports, right? You're, you're the best guy on your high school team, best guy on your college team. And it's still, you know... The percentage is just so far against you, but there are so many positions, right? In all the sports, all the teams, all the coaching staffs, there is one seat. There is one play-by-play seat for Monday Night Football. And so that's what makes you think it's, you know, it's it's so far out of the realm of possibility. And yet that was my dream job. I am I'm lucky enough to say I'm still super close with uh, two of my buddies from fourth grade. And they would tell you that Monday Night Football was always the dream job. And I just, I just never thought it was a possibility. I got the ESPN. And, you know, that was one of the criticisms, right? Hey, he's a hockey guy. Well, you know, ESPN was broadcasting three or four hockey games a week. There's inventory there. There's a seat and or a few seats. And so I was able to sort of earn my way into that. And then, um, and then look, things happen, right? One door opens, another door closes, and vice versa. And Mike Tirico, you just never think he's going to leave. You never think he's going to leave. And then... God bless Mike, and I love him, and he goes to NBC, and I know how ecstatic he is there, and dream job for him. And that opens the Monday night football seat. And then a couple things, other things happen, and it opens up again. So you just never think that's a possibility. It is a great lesson for all the young people out there. Uh, if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. I am living proof. And um, and you work hard, you do the best, and you got to get lucky too, Mike. I, I really feel that way. I, I've told everyone I'm the most – fortunate person in our industry. And listen, I was lucky to do the 11 o'clock sports center. So forget about doing the orange bowl and college football. And then Monday night, you know, I've been lucky throughout my entire career, 28 years or whatever it is at ESPN. And uh, I just keep knocking on wood, brother. I hope it keeps rolling. 
I want to ask you about uh, hockey because, as you mentioned, uh, you're a hockey guy. Um, myself and my colleague, A.J. Perez, have reported that ESPN is interested in getting live NHL game rights again when the contract is up. How would you like to see uh, NHL games back on E1 or E2? Absolutely. Bring it on. I mean, you know, I don't have to write the check to Gary Bettman. I get that. But uh, I've heard the same thing. Uh, listen, I, I've heard that for years, though, and I, I really believe uh, we've been in the mix. And the way it was explained to me, and I've always respected our bosses at ESPN. You know, I've been there a long time, but they don't owe me any explanation, right? I'm, I'm an employee like everybody else. Um, but I've heard from, you know, higher levels of management that we have been in every NHL negotiation since we lost it. And NBC's just had right of first refusal or whatever that might be. And, and so every time we come with a certain dollar figure, they go over the top and the NHL takes the money. And I, I get it. Uh, but so my point is, I think we've been interested really ever since we lost the rights. I know we're interested again in it. And it's a it's a business deal that that is way above me. Uh, but absolutely, are you kidding me? Let's let's do Monday night football. Take a take a few weeks off, and then go right into the Stanley Cup playoff run. Sign me up for that, Mike. I'm all in. <laughs> You're one of the Sports Center anchors, along with Van Pelt and a couple others, who's appeared in a ton of This Is Sports Center commercials. One of my personal favorites is when you ask Ovi, you know, hey, what are you a Russian spy or something? Yeah. <laughs> Talk about working with Ovechkin on that spot. So the, the cool backstory there is that is the single most expensive This Is Sports Center promo ever made. And the reason for that is they needed that contraption to lift him up through the through the ceiling, right? So um, so first of all, it looks like it's an office area, right? A copy room that was built out on our basketball court. For safety reasons, we couldn't actually have it inside a building. So imagine the cost of that. They have to in essence, replicate what a a copy room would look like, put up walls, doors, and a ceiling. And and so we do it on the basketball court. We had a stunt double for Ovechkin. You can imagine the the Capitals probably don't want their guy being lifted up through a ceiling. I mean, you know, that thing breaks. Um, And Ovechkin insisted on doing his own stunt. And uh, it was really cool. It was was a great one. And uh, it's funny because I, I don't know the exact year it was made, but, you know, during all the Russian spy stuff for the last year or two, that sort of came back around. And, you know, we had no idea what we were doing back then. And it sort of came back and was funny again. So uh, that's not everyday life in Bristol. I know we portray it that way. It's a, it's a shout out to uh, Wyden and Kennedy. That was the, uh, the firm that put those spots together. And if you really know us, we're, we're not that funny. or I'm certainly not that funny. Uh, but they gave us some personality and some flair. And those are always fun to be part of. Yeah. Last question, we'll let you go. Um, NFL draft, Trey Wingo is leaving uh, ESPN, as we know, after a great career, which opens up to me one of the all-time great jobs, which is host of the NFL draft as uh, originally done by Chris Berman. Is Steve Levy putting his hat in the ring for that? Uh, I would I would certainly be interested, but I'll be be honest, uh, Mike, I have not heard that from anyone inside the building. you know, it, it's kind of how I feel about the Monday Night Football conversation. I was sort of in the mix, you know, four or five years ago. My name was brought up. Uh, I'm happy to be in that conversation. It's it's quite an honor and a thrill to even be mentioned as a possibility, if that's the case. I would certainly love to be part of our draft coverage. The NFL is, is so smart taking that on the road. When they did that draft in Philadelphia, Las Vegas would have been spectacular. Cleveland will be great. Um Listen, if, if, if they said, would I be interested? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Raise my hand first in line. But uh, to this day, I have not heard from anyone along those lines. But I, I would be most interested in that. Yeah. Well, Steve, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, good luck the rest of the season to you and the Monday Night Football crew. And uh, join us next time for another episode of Fundamentals from Front Office Sports. See you, Mike. Thanks.